In this first podcast with Vartui, as her name is in Armenian, and Rose in English, we speak about how we met in the action group Stand with Armenia in relation to Azerbaijan's genocidal program against Armenians in Artsakh, from where they have been forced out. These are Armenians who have lived in Artsakh or nagorno karabakh for thousands of years, being thrown out of their ancestral homes by a country with no historical rights to the area until the Soviet Union created them from nothing. A country that is now a fully-fledged dictatorship funded through the insatiable greed of the EU and its partners in getting their hands on fossil fuel. The savage dishonesty of Western democracies continues in every arena on this planet. At home, we hear talk of democracy, freedom of speech, and human rights. Abroad, these same politicians fund and prop up regimes that murder innocents, including children, anywhere their interests take them. It is into this maelstrom of murder that the UN grants Azerbaijan the right to host COP29, a conference established to create a plan of action for humanity to limit the effects of the climate crisis. Make of that what you will. Unfortunately, Rose and I experienced some technical difficulties during the recording of this episode, and therefore some sentences had to be sacrificed. Thank you, Rose, for your time, and I look forward to our next chat that will focus on the heroic women of Artsakh. Two and a mic clocking out. Enjoy. I'm happy to say that I am joined here by Vartuhi, which means Rose in Armenian. Uh, Rose, thank you for coming to speak with me. Thank you very much for your welcome. Um, yes, my name is Rose. Rose is in French name, and in Armenian it's Vartui. Uh, Vartui is my first name. Huh? <laughs> I'm born in Armenia. Now I live in Marseille, and I teach history, geography, and geopolitics uh, about Marseille. Marseille is the older city of uh, of France. Is it in the south of uh, French too. Do you know Marseille? No? Yes, no? I do, luckily. Yeah. Ah, uh, the, he has a, a great football club, Olympique de Marseille. You know, <laughs> you know Olympique de Marseille, uh, which is yeah, the only yeah, team, the only team who are, we are won the Champions League. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, it's also as a large Armenian community. Uh, of around 100,000 people, Armenian. And we have uh, five Armenian churches, uh, several um, Armenian schools, a traditional dance group, a large avenue dedicated uh, to Armenian genocide, uh, a little, a uh, small Dijan Magapet, mm -hmm. yeah. a small Dijan Magapet, <laughs> but a small. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this um, is the, just so people know, Gizanagapert is the monument in Armenia dedicated, it's the eternal flame dedicated to the people who uh, were killed um, by the uh, Ottoman Empire in the Armenian Genocide in 1915. Um, yes, indeed. Yes, exactly. And statues and places of Armenian heroes like uh, Sogomon Telirian, Misak mm -hmm. uh, Manushian, and even a statue of Mother Armenia protecting her children. Uh, the community is dynamic and active, uh, and you can see uh, Armenian history in the city, all in the city. Well, it's very interesting uh, uh, city. And uh, voila, come to Marseille. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for um, hello, me, I'm currently working with Stand with Armenia, 
collective, the collective stand with Armenia, uh, which was created in 2020, um, 2020 during the 44 days um, uh, war. Uh, in this group, we try to spread information about the Armenian community in France, in um, Armenia, and also internationally, uh, if, you, if we can. And uh, um, our objective is uh, to try to reflect uh, on the situation of the community and provide an historical and geopolitical um, context. Not to just, you, we don't want just uh, spread the information, we want to reflect about it. For me, because I am a teacher, uh, it's important to explain events for um, historical and human uh, point of view. Yes, because um, for understanding, uh, you must have an, an historical and human point of view and not a global point of view as you see in the media. For example, in the media, Armenian is just a small country and uh, has no importance. It would have no impact on the rest of, on the, of the world. But this point of view distorts any understanding of the Armenian problem. To understand the Armenian problem, uh, you need to have first uh, know what Armenian really is and uh, how long he has existed and survived. Uh, after, you need to understand of uh, if the geography and the political structure have evolved. I can give you an example. You can speak uh, uh, about um, Armenian nation before uh, 1918. Uh, you can speak about uh, the, the, the kingdoms of Armenia, but not nation. After you, might, you need to understand the evolution of the Armenian people's thinking and the impact of the various colonization. And you must understand uh, the starting point of the Armenian initiative today is the genocide. But I, in my mind, uh, we need to move beyond the same reflection uh, in order to evolve. Well, we must... Uh, uh, learn our, the story of our heritage, civilization, story of Armenia, and uh, so on. I think it's very interesting as well, because very often when I speak with people for the first time and they find out I am of Armenian ethnic origin, uh, one of the first things they say, oh yeah, okay, the genocide. Or, of course, really? they yes. say, oh, I've never heard of Armenians, what are they? Um, so, so unfortunately, uh, sometimes we connect our very identities with the event of the genocide. And as you say, Armenian history goes back thousands of years. And so the unfortunate thing would be to lose ourselves in one single tragic event, which obviously has affected our uh, worldview since 1915. And so therefore, there's so much more uh, to identify with and to also analyze with regards to our uh, culture. Yes, we um, we must to move beyond um, on this tragic um, event uh, eventment because the the civilization of Armenian people is uh, very great. If you have all these uh, facts, you can understanding, you can uh, thinking about the Armenian problem. I agree with you absolutely, um, and definitely something which would be. Yeah, interesting to analyze further um, the geopolitical history as well. So not many people are really too aware uh, of Armenia's historical interactions with Rome, with Byzantine, with the Persian Empire, with the Greeks and so on. So there's there's so much that has occurred over the last uh, two millennia, at least, that um, many people are just unaware of. And, and these are things which uh, which do require more attention. Uh, another Part of our conversation before was to talk um, a little bit about COP. So we got together uh, through the Stand with Armenia action group. And one of the main issues that brought me in, um, other than the fact of my Armenian heritage, but it's also my interest in the uh, environmental uh, situation, climate crisis that we're in. And, and COP29 has been given to... A, a fossil fuel country, a dictatorship, 
um, a country which is guilty of genocide. And once again, you are very consistent in your methodology. When you want to talk about and think about Armenians, you want to go back through the history of Armenians to understand the basis from where they come. And you, for you, it's also the same. To understand COP29, it's important to go back before to be able to understand where uh, the entire movement and uh, it comes from and, and what it signifies. So uh, do you want to tell us a bit about that as well? COP29 is a very cynical COP. After genocide on September um, 2023, it's very a cynical de decision. Not human, uh, not uh, real. Um, and the question is very uh, interesting to understand why the COP is in Azerbaijan. They have three uh, options. Armenia, Bulgaria, and Azerbaijan. And uh, Armenia can do the COP. Uh, Bulgaria uh, late in uh, Azerbaijan to, to have the, the COP. But uh, in the United Nations, this is not the, the, the mission, the objective of the United Nations to go in the dictatorial state and to forget what uh, happened uh, in the state. The objective of the COPs are very clear. The, the COP, it's about founding solution to avoid climate change. And uh, these uh, objectives must concern all member states. Every state must participate in this effort. Uh, the question of the environment is recent in this story, but we have media, we know what uh, is as a region. And the United Nations have the objective to protect the human rights too. I can say the, the, these rights are, div, uh, are recent too, because uh, the United Nations is not, uh, it's just a recent institution. But uh, uh, if you don't protect the human rights and you want to protect the planet, it's not normal. The creation of the United Nations is inseparable from value and human dignity. It's written uh, that they must be not left behind. In French, in French you say, laissez pour compte. The United Nations is an international government and its principles are accepted in principle for all, all states. Its human values are written on the walls of the United Nations. There are new uh, values uh, in the history of humanity, but which the United Nations often forgets during, during the, the difficult events, during the nine months blockade inflict, inflicted on the population of the Republic of Arza, the United Nations did nothing. Uh, that's not normal. Yeah, so just to re reiterate then, you pointed out that uh, it's a part of the the responsibilities of the United Nations uh, to protect human dignity as well. Um, mm -hmm. And they have clearly failed in this responsibility, not just with regards to the people of uh, Artsakh and Armenia, but they are also failing people around the world. The global south is also being neglected. Um, uh, many countries also in, in Asia uh, are also being neglected. Uh, and so therefore, there really must be a case for revisiting the structure and purpose of the United Nations. And, and one, of, one of the issues which brings this very clearly to the forefront of our understanding is exactly this decision to, to give or the responsibility to host COP29 uh, to a genocidal fossil fuel state, um, it is completely in contradiction uh, to all of the humane principles of the United Nations. I'm talking about a smoke, um, smoke screen. Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, why to talk about a smoke screen? And uh, because um, uh, just look at the reaction on so, uh, social media. Uh, or, or, or the activities of United Nations officials. Uh, we have an organization operates global governments 
And this government is a recent development. It has existed since the beginning of decolonization. This image is a show and communicated is that of a benevolent uh, organization eager to help the countries in the world and to apply uh, human rights wherever it can. On the, in the United Nations, we speak about the status of women, uh, we speak about the protection of children, the preservation of the heritage, all with the aim um, of achieving a common good. The image is very good of the United Nations. But uh, uh, is it the reality? Have you given uh, everyone access to this common future? Uh, will Arta be protected and preserved? Uh, what are the actions? Uh, United Nations protect uh, nobody in Arta uh, between um, nine months uh, uh, on the blockade. Uh, the, uh, the helping nobody, no, any children. Uh, the population, the, the Altar population is a civil population with a number very important of children, um, very important of women. And they, uh, they forget, they really forget, they close the, the question. You said that the, the United Nations Ha, have done nothing uh, or did nothing during the um, nine months of the blockade. And um, before, and before too, between the the 44, uh, uh, 44 days war, they they didn't do nothing. Like this country is not existed. And what was also very uh, touching and a very emotional subject when I read about what you had written. Um, you said that more than 2,000 babies were born in the odious mm. extermination camp. And you wrote with your, in your own words, which I've translated, defying death itself with their screams. So you were saying that Azerbaijan attacked the maternity wards and they had a very clear objective for this. Ah, oui. Uh, yes, there's a clear objective for, for this. Um, uh, the state is committing one to commit a genocide. That's all. Uh, I say you, he, um, in, the, in the Azerbaijan political, you have a racism against Armenians, just against Armenians. Uh, this is in the structure of the government. That's not a racism, I don't like you, I don't love you. Uh, uh, this is, is the program on the, the go Azerbaijan government. Yep. Well, indeed. That's um, why you can speak about genocide. Yeah, indeed. Genocide and um, in the least apartheid, which unfortunately is uh, a situation that we are, we also have seen uh, in the Israel and Palestine conflict too. And mm -hmm. the same tactics of attacking uh, hospitals and educational centers there in Gaza as well. So it's a very, uh, it's a horrific tactic. Um, it's a tactic which is used to completely destroy a culture. And the fact that it's being used in this case as well and forcing people to leave their homeland as they have from Artsakh um, really is an issue which the international community has to look at. And they simply cannot reward a genocidal country by giving them the, uh, the hosting rights for such conferences. Um, Vartui, thank you very much for oh, coming and talking with me. I look forward to talking in the future again about the Armenian women of Artsakh. I'm very looking forward to this conversation. Um, and thank you. Um, oh, thank you very time. much. But thank you very much too. Two and a mic.